In the early days of Al-Andalus, the Muslim Umayyad Khilafa had repeatedly sent armies into Gaul, which is modern-day France, reaching as far as the outskirts of Paris under Abdurrahman al-Ghafiqi. After Charles Martel pushed the Muslims back, there were more attempts from the Muslims to go beyond the Pyrenees. In that period, the longest time that the Muslims maintained a stronghold in France was in the city of Nabon, or Urbuna in the Arabic language. It is a city in the south of France. Narbonne was under the Muslims from the year 720 in the Common Era until the Carolingian king, Pepin the Short, had conquered it in the year 750 in the Common Era. It is around the year 274 Hijri, corresponding to 887 in the Common Era. Twenty Muslims from El Andalus board a small ship and set sail towards the east seeking to continue the victory of the Muslims of El Andalus. This time, in the lands of the Franks, after having been defeated by the armies of Charles Martel well over a century ago. A strong wind forces their ship to sail towards the coast of southern Gaul. In the darkness of the night, they find themselves in the land of El Ifranj, the Franks. They were not the first Muslims to land on these shores. Before them, there were Muslims that fought in Marseille, Camarug, and Arles. This time, it was different. This time, they intended to establish a Muslim settlement under Beni Umayyah in El Andalus. They found the perfect place to engage the Franks and establish a Muslim settlement. The mountain we know as Jebel El Qilal, the place they call Fraxinatum in Latin. One side of it is guarded by the sea, while the only other entrance is through a grove of thorny plants that would puncture and rip the flesh of any soldiers marching through or even trying to flee back out. From this vantage point, the Muslims could disrupt the advances of the Franks, who had been incessantly leading intermittent attacks and raids in El Andalus, inciting the Christian northern kingdoms against the Muslims. They often gave aid and support to Muslim rebels that had turned against the authority of Cordoba, Cordoba, and Beni Umayyah, the leaders of the Muslims in El Andalus. No good has come from rebellions. The rebels even decided to ally with the Christians to fight against the Khalifa. This is an example of the evils that disobedience and rebellions lead to. The Muslims of Fraxinatum were Andalusi, and they had support from the Khalifa of El Andalus, Abdurrahman al Nasr. According to Ibn Hayyan and the Christian chronicler Luprand, they were a thorn in the sides of the Frankish kings and a formidable distraction for the Christian armies. One hundred of the warriors of El Andalus had answered their call and set forth to join them. Meanwhile, the local tribes and fiefdoms in, in the neighboring provincials were too busy killing one another over land and other domestic squabbles, so they had no time to fight the Muslims. That is, until one faction realized that they could seek help from these Muslims. This only strengthened the Muslim stronghold in Fraxinatum. People began to join them, some accepting Islam and others forging alliances and remaining Christian. However, those that refused to abide by the conditions of the Muslims had fled. Other Muslims from El Andalus and El Maghrib, meaning North Africa, began to join them. By the year 278 Hijri, or 891 in the Common Era, they had established themselves in the region, having dominion over all of Provence. By 293 Hijri, or 906 in the Common Era, the Muslims of Jabal al Qilal sent expeditions to fight as far as western Italy. They took the city of Aquae with a small number of warriors, and they faced little resistance from the locals, surprisingly while being significantly outnumbered. Perhaps the locals saw more good in these Muslims than what was written by the Christian chroniclers that felt humiliated by the strength of the Muslims in Fraxinatum. These Muslims were adept at navigating the mountains, for only a few decades later in 327 Hijri, or 939 in the Common Era, they crossed the Alps and began fighting in northern Italy and southern Switzerland. They destroyed the Abbey of Aquain and the Monastery of St. Gall. They established strongholds there and went further north into Alemannia and Raetia. They went eastward to Lombardy and in Italy and westward to Grenoble. The Muslims did not slaughter the locals that were not fighters, as some of the Christian chroniclers claimed. 
Aside from that behavior contradicting the rules of jihad in Islam, it also makes little sense, with such a small number, to leave such vast areas empty and depopulate the villages. As we mentioned in our video on the concept of Islamic fath or victory, the locals who did not freely accept Islam of their own will continued to live under the Muslim rule as dhimmis, or protected peoples. They would pay a nominal jizya rather than paying the mandated zakat that is mandatory on every Muslim to pay on their wealth. They were allowed to continue to self-govern under the leadership of the Muslims. And this actually explains why they faced such little resistance, whereas other non-Muslim fighters like the Hungarians who had invaded these regions were fought vehemently by the local population. The people were treated better under the Muslims, without a doubt. The Franks that had sworn enmity to them, meaning the Muslims, were not able to defeat them, despite the Muslims being relatively small in number and residing in the backyard of the Frankish kingdom, with little means for air military support from El Andalus, maybe except through naval defense. In the year 329 Hijri, or 941 in the Common Era, the king of Italy, Hugh of Arles, sought assistance from the Roman emperor in the east, meaning the Byzantines, Romanus Lecapenos, to bring his navy and his army to help fight against Fraxinetum by land and sea. Using Greek fire, they were able to devastate the Muslim fleet. Defeat of the Muslims seemed imminent, as the small settlement could not obtain reinforcements from El Andalus or from North Africa. But King Hugh decided that it suited his interests more to ally with the Muslims rather than kill them. Getting the favor of Abdurrahman and Nasser in El Andalus would help him build better trade relations. And maybe these Muslims in Fraxinetum could even help him against his enemies in Italy, especially those vying for his throne. The Christian chroniclers unleashed their pens and viciously attacked King Hugh for his alliance with the Muslims. How could the Christian king of Italy concede to peace with the Muslims when he vastly outnumbered them? Was his wealth and power more beloved to him than defeating the Muslims? Well, yes, that's exactly it. With this treaty in place, the Muslims were a nice buffer for the Italians against their enemies in Europe. The Muslims went further into German territories, a mistake that likely sparked their downfall. Otto I, the German king of the Holy Roman Empire, sent an embassy to Abdurrahman al Nasser pleading with him to intervene and stop the Muslims of Fraxinetum from their attacks on the passes that were led by the commander Nasser bin Ahmed. When it was clear that the Khalifa Abdurrahman al Nasser would not stop them, the Franks under Otto I gathered an army to destroy the small Muslim uh, settlement of Fraxinetum. In the year 343 Hijri, or 954 in the Common Era, the Muslims fought the Hungarians in the West. The Hungarians brought a lot of grief to other European kingdoms, so this was a welcomed conflict for the Franks. Conrad of Burgundy took advantage of this to slaughter the Muslims and the Hungarians in one go. These Muslims were even able to take the abbot of Cluny, Maolos, as prisoner for ransom in the great St. Bernard Pass in the Swiss Alps. And this was probably the key event that triggered the unified effort of the Christian armies against the Muslims of Jabal al-Qilal. By the year 365 Hijri, corresponding to 972 in the Common Era, the Muslim settlement of Jabal al-Qilal was no more. Expelled by the army of Count William of Arelis, Fraxinetum later became La Garde Frenae, which is still around today. A history lost. A history forgotten. This little-known Muslim settlement was by no means just a footnote in the history of Europe. Their reign spanned from Provence and went well into the Swiss Alps, and they even ventured to Italy from the north. This small state lasted for a hundred years, an entire century of Muslim rule in southern France and parts of Switzerland. It continues to baffle many Western writers that cannot seem to fathom how a small number of Muslims could have taken over and held a territory in France, Switzerland, and Italy for such a long time. One Orientalist described it as a foreign and strange Islamic state into the heart of Christian Europe. These Muslims faced little resistance, being able to thrive for nearly a century in the region, bringing despair to the Christian lords of the neighboring areas, fearing for their rule and the spread of Islam. <laughs> 
Sadly, many of the Christians were ignorant of Islam and looked at Muslims the way they looked at the pagan barbarians that kept invading them from the north. This view was fueled by the Muslims in Jabal al-Qilal preventing Christian pilgrims from freely traveling through the passes that they controlled. The sources that speak about this Muslim settlement are scarce, most either lost or forgotten in history books, both Arabic and Frankish Roman sources. In fact, there is more information about the Muslim settlement of Jabal al-Qilal available to us in the Frankish sources than in Arabic. Most of these sources are Christian chronicles written by bishops and priests that hated the advancements of Muslims into Europe. Aside from the theological differences with Islam, they viewed Muslims as pirates, bandits, and barbarians from the desert. One common theme in the Latin sources describes the Muslims as Saracens rather than refer to them as Muslims. This is a common term in Western texts that speak about Muslims throughout the Middle Ages. The origin of the word is debated. One argument states that it comes from the Greek word Sarakinos, which is Sharqi in Arabic meaning an Easterner. The Christians of Europe, however, used it as a pejorative to degrade the Muslims, as is evident in a lot of medieval manuscripts. Professor Diana Dock presents a more likely etymology from the Arabic saraqa, meaning to steal. This type of bias continued to show up until as recent as the 1980s, exposing some of the biases that exist till very recently. Meanwhile, the Arabic sources speak of the founders of Fraxinetum as Mujahidun, meaning those who fought for the sake of Allah, not seeking worldly life or riches. One of the earliest references to Fraxinetum is in Al Masalik wal Mamalik of Al Istakhri. It was mentioned in Surat Al Ard of Ibn Hawqal and Al Muqtabas of Ibn Hayyan al Andalusi, while other Muslim historians like Yaqut al Hamawi also reference the region. Later Muslim historians like Shakib Arsalan wrote briefly about them. Western sources provide more detail, albeit these were more contemporary Christian chroniclers. For instance, it's Liut Prand of Cremona, the deacon of the Pavian church, who mentioned that it was only 20 Muslims that settled from Andalus and settled in Fraxinetum. He wrote this chronicle of the kings and emperors of Europe for the Mozarab bishop of Elvira, Resamund or Rabia bin Zaid, as he was known in Arabic who served the Christians living in Al-Andalus. Liudbrand, or Lutbrand, as he may also be called, was definitely amazed at these Muslims, but not in a good way. He described them as pirates, and even accused them of depopulating entire towns. We know, however, that these Muslims were not some break-off group of Andalusian pirates who raided and pillaged as he tries to describe them, but rather they were seasoned soldiers as attested to by Muslim historians. They were skilled and able to support the Qairwani Muslims from Tunisia who besieged Italy from the south. And we should note that their actions were no different than anyone else of this time. It was quite common for people of various different backgrounds, ethnicities and religions to enter areas, conquer certain parts and remain or settle or otherwise engage in either trade or warfare. But the claims that they were pirates and looters show the type of bias that early Western historians had for Muslims. These biases must be challenged before anyone can claim any sort of academic integrity. The claims, for example, that Muslims devastated everything in their path and depopulated entire villages is no doubt untrue. How could a small number of Muslims devastate an entire population backed by armies of local lords and protectorates in lands that they were unfamiliar with? Renou, a 19th century Orientalist who famously pushes the anti-Muslim narrative, described this time as an epoch of Muslim domination where French patriots should be humiliated or ashamed that people from Asia ruled this land. Despite the bias, he does not deny the historical fact that the Muslims were in France for a century, unlike some modern Orientalists who outright deny the possibility of Jabal al-Qilal, regardless of the numerous contemporary sources from different regions and even recent archaeological discoveries confirming its authenticity. Another bias we see is that some Orientalists accept the European sources without question or critique, even when being contradictory.
while ignoring Arab and Muslim historians or claiming that these accounts are exaggerated. It's a trait of 19th century Orientalism that quite blatantly expressed French and European superiority in their writings. But in reality, we see that even the European sources could not completely hide the truth. Liutprand or Lutprand himself says that Adalbert had fled and sought asylum with the Muslims. It is also reported that Muslims aided the locals in their disputes against one another and lived in their fortifications unchallenged for decades, and even that Muslims faced little opposition in the majority of areas. Professor Kirsten Rennie points out much of the nationalistic rhetoric of the 19th century Orientalists about these Muslims is problematic. The social and cultural influence in these regions of southern France can be seen in the agriculture as well as ship repair techniques. Architectural influences are prevalent as well as other cultural evidences of the Muslim impact on the local population that persists till today. One of the regions that was settled by the Muslims is still known today as Masif de Mo, meaning the mountain of the Moors, or the Moors Plateau. As more information is critically studied, we're starting to see a shift in the narrative that helps us better understand just how 20 Muslims from Al-Andalus struck fear in the heart of European kings and brought Islam to southern France. Thank you all for watching. والحمد لله رب العالمين